Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snetus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our bleeding and coagulation playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about platelet count. Today, let's discuss bleeding time. So let's get started. This is my bleeding and coagulation playlist. I have more than 70 videos already. Please help me reach 250,000 subscribers by the end of the month, and I have a gift for you. Platelets came from myeloid stem cells, which came from pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. As we have discussed in previous videos, hemostasis is prevention of blood loss. You stop the bleeding. How? By forming a thrombus, a clot. Cool, what are the steps? First, you vasoconstrict the vessel. Temporary platelet plug, this is primary hemostasis by platelets. And then coagulation, this is secondary hemostasis by coagulation factors. And then fibrinolysis, which is, let's dissolve the clot and restore normal blood flow. So here is the story, morning glory. You have injured yourself, finger cut. And then what's happened? Vasoconstriction. And then followed by temporary platelet plug, this is called primary hemostasis. After that, depending on the type of trauma and the size of the vessel, if it's a very small trauma and or a very small vessel, platelet plug is very sufficient. But if it's a large trauma in the big vessel, we need the coagulation cascade, which is secondary hemostasis. To lay down fibrin meshwork, RBCs are going to be stuck between the fibrin fibers. After that, the clot is going to contract, producing serum. Serum is a defibrinated plasma. Watch my previous video on the difference between serum and plasma. It's called serum versus plasma. After that, fibrinolysis lets destroy the clot and restore the normal blood flow. And we restore the normal blood flow and let's regenerate the injured, traumatized vessel. Steps of bleeding and coagulation, vasoconstriction, primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrinolysis. Vasoconstriction, we have talked about it before. Primary hemostasis, this is the platelet plug. What are the lab tests? Platelet count and bleeding time. What are the drugs that are inhibiting primary hemostasis? They are called antiplatelets, and we divide them into three groups. The first group is the cyclooxygenase inhibitors, and the cyclooxygenase inhibitors are Mr. Aspirin, and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. That's the first group. The second group is called P to Y12 inhibitors. How do they work? They inhibit P to Y12. So what? So what? This is going to inhibit the ADP-dependent expression, expression of GP2B3A. Without GP2B3A, there is no platelet aggregation. What is an example of P to Y12 inhibitors? Clopidogrel. I want another example. How about Prasugrel? The end in grill, they are probably P2Y12 inhibitors. And the third and last one is GP2B3A antagonist or inhibitor, such as the famous Apsiximab. And there is another one called Tirofiban, a third one called Eptifabetide. These are the drugs that inhibit primary hemostasis. How do we measure primary hemostasis? You measure the platelet number using the platelet count. You measure the platelet function using bleeding time and other tests. Bleeding and coagulation. Step number three is the secondary hemostasis. You can thank the coagulation factors. What are the drugs that inhibit the coagulation factors? They are called anticoagulant. And we have three subtypes again. One, two, and guess what? Three. What is number one? Warfarin. Warfarin or coumarin or dicumarol or coumadin, whatever. Warfarin inhibits the extrinsic coagulation pathway. The second one is heparin. Heparin inhibits the intrinsic coagulation pathway. By the way, heparin is natural. You already have heparin right now. Oh, but I never went to the hospital in the last two years. I know. You have heparin in your body right now. Oh, really? Yeah. And after that, we have direct thrombin inhibitors, such as the famous argatroban. Argatroban. Look at this. Ban thrombin. Thrombin ban inhibits thrombin. It's called a direct thrombin inhibitor. Mechanisms of action. What's the mechanism of action of warfarin? Warfarin inhibits vitamin K dependent gamma carboxylation in the liver, which will inhibit the production of factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, protein S, protein Z. Cool, what's the mechanism of action of heparin? Heparin stimulates antithrombin-3, and then antithrombin-3 is going to inhibit factors 9, 10, 11, 12. You can add 2 and 7 as well. If it's called antithrombin, it might inhibit thrombin. Imagine my shock. 
That's amazing. What are the lab tests to test for secondary hemostasis? We have PT and PTT. The old test, if you are a dinosaur, is called thrombin time or clotting time or coagulation time. And then after that, we have fibrolysis. Let's dissolve the clot and restore the function. What are the drugs that are stimulating fibrinolysis? They are called fibrinolytics, such as what? Such as the natural TPA, natural urokinase, not so natural for you, but natural for the bacteria, streptokinase. Another drug, alteplase, tenecteplase, tenotoplase, whatever place. That's impressive medicosis. Cool, but I've noticed something. Here you talked antiplatelets, you inhibited primary hemostasis. And then anticoagulants, you inhibited secondary hemostasis. But here you said fibrinolytics, you stimulated fibrinolysis. I want some drugs to inhibit fibrinolysis. Okay, honey, calm down. They are called anti-fibrinolytics, such as the famous drug eta or epsilon amino caproic acid. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, this is epsilon, this is not eta. I'm so sorry, I don't know Greek, even though the name of my channel is Medicosis Perfectionalis. Primary hemostasis versus secondary hemostasis. Quickly, who is the hero here? Platelets. Here, coagulation factors. Platelets came from the bone marrow, from the megakaryocytes. Coagulation factors, most of them came from the liver. Tests. Platelet count and bleeding time. Test for this, PT and PTT. What are the symptoms if you have a disease affecting primary hemostasis? I get superficial bleeding called mucocutaneous bleeding. Give me examples. You have spontaneous bleeding. You have petechiae, even bigger, purpura, and even bigger, ecchymosis. How about secondary hemostasis problems? Anatomical bleeding, deep tissue bleeding, such as bleeding into joints, bleeding into muscles, intracranial bleeding, bleeding after dental procedures, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. Let's go back to square one. Primary hemostasis, what is the end result? A platelet plug. How about secondary hemostasis? A fibrin thrombus. Which one is stronger? Of course, the fibrin thrombus. But of course, we need to go from primary to secondary if you want to have a fibrin thrombus. So primary hemostasis is really important because without it, there is no secondary. We've talked about this in the previous video, platelets. We have platelet number and platelet function. Platelet number, how do we test for it? Platelet count. How about platelet function, bleeding time? Among other tests. Condition, thrombocytopenia, you have decreased platelet count. How about decreased platelet function, thrombosthenia, weak platelets. Example, aplastic anemia, example, Bernard Soulier and Glensman thrombosthenia. Now let's go to the lab and try to measure platelet number and let's try to measure or assess platelet function. Platelet number, manual counting, automated counting by the automated analyzer, the stupid butt machine, optical counting, flow cytometry, platelet count ratio method. This is the old method, this is the new method and of course these are very sophisticated. Lab results to measure platelet function. Of course to measure platelet function you need platelet number. So all of these plus others, bleeding time, platelet aggregometry. How do you force platelets to aggregate? You add an agonist, such as ADP, epinephrine, or collagen, among others. Platelet function simulation in vitro, platelet mediated thrombin generation, platelet activation measurement. These are very sophisticated, and I'm so happy I went to medical school. I didn't have to learn all of this. God bless those lab scientists. They have to put up with all of this crap. It's a reason for medical students to be optimistic your life could have been even worse. Let's use the Socratic dialogue. How can we stop bleeding in a small blood vessel? Platelet plug in a big blood vessel? Fibrin thrombus. What is that called? Platelet plug is called primary hemostasis. What are the steps? Adhesion, activation, aggregation, infusion. This is just a summary. If you need the detailed steps, there are about eight of them. Watch my previous video called platelet plug. How can we evaluate platelet function in primary hemostasis? You need platelet count first and then the platelet function, bleeding time, platelet aggregometry, and all of this crap. What are the steps of platelet plug formation? Discussed before, platelet, subendothelial collagen, adhesion, thanks to GP1B on the platelet, and von Willebrand factor on the subendothelium. Next, activation, they will activate and secrete ADP and thromboxane A2 to help aggregate the platelets. Okay, here we have a receptor called GP2B3A, it's ADP dependent. After that, a platelet is going to bind to a platelet, this is called aggregation. So adhesion is between a platelet and the endothelium, but aggregation is between a platelet and another freaking platelet. 
GP2B3A here, GP2B3A here, fiber engine in between. After that, the two platelets will fuse together, and this is called fusion. At that moment, platelet plug has formed, it's ready. At that moment, bleeding time has ended. Bleeding time, what is the aim to measure platelet function to assess primary hemostasis types in vivo and in vitro? We'll talk about the technique in vivo. In vitro, you just send it to the lab scientists and they will figure it out. God bless them. Duke method is very good. IV method is really horrible, not to be confused with Ivy League schools or poison ivy for that matter. Duke method, just a pinch, just a cut using a lancet. Or a needle has to be sterile and of course you wipe the patient's finger with alcohol before you poke him poke the patient and then drops of blood are going to come down bring a filter paper and touch the wound you'll find a big drop touch it again smaller drop touch it again smaller drop which means the platelet plug is forming and bleeding is about to stop touch it again a drop touch oh no drop look at the finger of the patient you see glassy surface what, what why do why why is it so shiny and beautiful this is the plated plug man normally it's two to five minutes if it took the patient 15 minutes to actually form the plated plug it means the patient has a problem with the primary hemostasis the other method is very invasive you get a scalpel you take a cut a longitudinal cut in the undersurface of the forearm and then bleeding is gonna end, it's very similar, but here the normal is 3 to 10, because of course the cut is longer and bigger, abso freaking lootly. Should I memorize this or I memorize this? Neither, you should memorize this. 3 to 7 minutes is the normal bleeding time. But calm your butt down. On your exam, when they give you a patient with a problem in the primary hemostasis, bleeding time will probably be greater than 10, so just memorize 7 or 10. Memorize anything. I have a premium antibiotics course available at medicosisperfectionalist.com. For students who are super sophisticated to the point of being stupid, listen, sunshine, a normal bleeding time cannot predict the safety of surgical procedure. Do not say, oh, bleeding time is normal, therefore we can go ahead with the surgery and it's all gonna be okay without no comp... Shut up. A shortened bleeding time is usually not clinically significant. In other words, remember the normal bleeding time? Yes, three to seven minutes. Less than three, I really don't care. More than 7, especially more than 10, now I do care because this is a problem. We have a problem, Brutus. I mean, Houston. Bleeding time is prolonged in cases of thrombocytopenia or thrombosthenia. Either the platelets are low in number or low in function. Either way, you'll have a prolonged bleeding time, which is going to be greater than 7. Examples of thrombocytopenia, aplastic anemia, Fanconi anemia, your bone marrow is toast, ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. How about thrombosthenia, Glensman thrombosthenia, von Willebrand disease, uremia, gamma globulinemia, such as multiple myeloma, I meant hypergammaglobulinemia, increased gamma globulins, antiplatelet drugs such as aspirin and non-steroidals are here, and then we have the P2Y12 inhibitors such as clopidogrel, prasugrel, and last we have apsiximab, terofiban, eptifabidi, the GP2B3A inhibitors. How about liver disease and Bernard Soulier? They have both. They can lead to thrombocytopenia and thrombosthenia. Together, of course, bleeding time will be prolonged. If you want to test your knowledge on bleeding and coagulation issues, go get my 50 hematology cases at medicosisperfectionalis.com. From the previous video, we talked about platelet count. Here is platelet count in a nutshell. And here is a second nutshell about bleeding time. Beautiful. Question of the day. What's the most common cause of a prolonged bleeding time? Let me know the answer in the comment. You'll find the answer in the next video. That's why you should subscribe and hit the bell so that you get notified when I release the next video. Support me here or here. Get my cardiac pharmacology course and my antibiotics course and my 50 hematology cases at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.